our next speaker is from Zillis, and Zillis maintains Milvis, which is a distributed open source vector database. And if you've known me for over a year, you know that I used to work on this. And today we're going to have Frank Liu, who is the head of AI ML at Zillis, and he has a rich history of building innovative AI tools and recently published a very interesting article on new architecture for vision models, which he may or may not touch on. Frank is an expert in AI and ML, and today he's here to talk to us about one of the hottest topics in Gen AI, which is multimodal RAG. Frank, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for that intro. Um, yeah, that was uh, that was that, that was quite the <laughs> intro. But <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, as uh, as Eugene mentioned, today I'm here to talk about multimodal RAG. I'm actually going to share my screen here real quick. So what I want to do is I want to go through uh, more or less a couple of slides first. Just talk about you know what 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 RAG looks like today. I think what RAG is going to look like in the future as well. And also, I want to go through at the very end, possibly a very very quick demo, showing not the whole end to end RAG system just yet, because a lot of the models out there today they only support images, and uh, well, they support primarily text, and some of them support images. But I want to demonstrate primarily the retrieval portion, so the R bit in RAG. So without further ado, I'll get right into it. Um, uh, the, you know, I want to start off with, you know, this is an architecture that, you know, a lot of folks here, uh, know really, really well, uh, this is just vanilla rag. And essentially what you're doing is you're taking it, you're taking your documents, you're taking, you know, whatever information, whatever text-based information that you have, giving it to an embedding model, storing it in a vector database. And then you do the same thing every time you get, let's say a prompt or you get a query uh, or a question. Uh, you do the same thing. You retrieve the most relevant documents and you add that as context into your generative AI model. So this is a uh, this is actually a diagram that uh, one of our one, one of our developer advocates put together, and I'm really just borrowing it here. But it's a good high level overview. It's a good simplified sort of workflow of how RAG works. It looks complicated, but really what you're doing is finding relevant context and giving it to your large language model. There's a lot of other great vector databases out there as well. Uh, I know we have a talk from uh, from other from other vector database folks here at the mid year mid mid year JNAI Zoo too. Um, and you're not limited to using a vector database either. You can also use knowledge graphs. In some cases, you can use uh, you know traditional relational databases or document databases as well. But vector databases and using vector search is a very very common way of doing RAG. And I think uh, one of the points that I like to touch on is, uh, is answering the question of whether or not RAG is dead. And you'll sort of see two camps here. Uh, you know, the first is 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 this, you know, first set. The first camp says that you know because LLMs, the context window is getting larger. Now we have tools like infinite attention. Um, you know, LLMs are becoming smaller. Uh, the cost is going to go down over time, and RAG is going to be obsolete. Right, um, and then you say, you know, there's 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 a lot of hype around the fact that 10 million tokens uh, afforded by Gemini 1.5 essentially pretty much kills most of these RAG frameworks or RAG applications. And I think there's there's lots of evidence out there to the contrary. Right, first is that when you have a lot of documents, if you have a lot of information in your context window, it tends to make the large language model focus on some non-relevant bits and pieces of information. So that's the first thing, right? The second thing is that each token is also significantly more expensive than a simple retrieval step from a vector database. And that's always going to be the case. So if you're worried about cost and if you're worried about relevancy, you always, always, always are going to want to use RAG, at least with the current generation of large language models. Um, and then, you know, you see, you know, there's all these, you know, I, I talked about this a little bit already, but there's all sorts of these problems, you know, you have lost in the middle, which a lot of these needle in the haystack and lost in the middle experiments are sort of solved. I'm not going to say 100%, but are sort of solved by a lot of these, uh, by a lot of today's LLMs, but you still have that problem of, you know, you get these large language models to focus on the wrong bits and pieces of content when you have too many tokens in your context window. Um, this is, uh, you know, again, uh, very, very, very similar concept here. Um, and also one thing that I do want to say is that, uh, you know, RAG and large language model, the context window of a large language model that really meant to work hand in hand. So just as you have a computer and a computer, you have, you know, this really, really fast L1, L2, L2 cache, uh, you also have main memory and then you have secondary memory. And that secondary memory is usually some sort of disk. Uh, it's some sort of, or, you know, it could be some NFS. 
And you want something very, very similar for your large language models, for your RAG applications, right? The computer or the processor itself is the attention mechanism inside of large language models. And the main memory is really the context window. The databases or the data stores that you have, I'm not going to limit it to just vector databases. They are your secondary memory. They really are the disk that you want to use with your RAG application. So I think it really helps to, I really like to reframe it in sort of the reframe the whole thing to you know, these traditional compute frameworks, traditional computer frameworks. And I think it helps gives us a gives us a better idea of why we need uh, why we need RAG, why it's still relevant today. And uh, what are some of the really, really great things that we can do with it moving forward as well? So again, I'm going to revisit uh, revisit this slide from the very beginning. But this is vanilla rag, right? You have documents. You uh, give it into you give a you feed it into an embedding model, and you store those vectors inside of some sort of vector database. When you do the retrieval, you have you know a cert, you, you have a search, or you have some sort of question that you're giving to the large language model. That goes through the embedding model first. You perform a query to your vector database. You get the relevant context, and then you put the question or whatever the original prompt was with that context into your generative AI model, into your large language model, and you get a reliable answer. Right. And what I want to focus on today is sort of the idea that there's now a RAG 2.0. So I imagine a lot of the folks here have seen the um, I forget, I forget when it was, but the GPT 4.0 announcement, uh, they sort of did a, did a little bit of jostling with Google. So I think Google's IO happened exactly the next day. They, they announced very, very similar things, but now it takes not just text modalities, but it also takes, uh, audio visual modalities. And of course, some of the original text as well. So when we think about this, right, what does that mean for rag? It means that we're going to have to go beyond just text. We're gonna have to go beyond just documents. And the reason for that is simply because now we have large language models that support many, many modalities of data and we wanna take advantage of all of them. We would wanna take advantage of all of the unstructured data that we have and be able to put all of that rich content, rich information, all of that rich data into our vector database. Or again, doesn't necessarily have to be a vector database, whatever data store that you're using and feed the most relevant bits and pieces of all of it into, into our large language model. Right. So this 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 sort of architecture I call I like to call RAG 2.0. It is multimodal RAG at its core, and there's many many ways of doing this. Right. Um, the 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 simplest and easiest way is to transcribe audio and have a sort of an image to text an image uh, image to text sort of an image description model. And to have, you know, take all of your unstructured data modalities, represent them as text, and feed them into your vector database that way. I think that's actually not necessarily a great way of doing multimodal RAG. Maybe you could call that RAG 1.5, right? I think the right way of doing RAG is to leverage these really, really powerful multimodal models that we now have. And this, this one's actually called ImageBind. I think it was from, I think it was released over a year ago at this point. Um, and this is a really, this is a six modality embedding model. So it can take images, videos, uh, audio, text, uh, depth images, and also IMU data. So inertial measurement unit data. So you have, everybody has a, has a, has a phone and there's IMUs inside of that phone to help track movement. You know, it can, it can, step counters are based off of that. And, uh, and, and it's really, really useful for tracking all sorts of um, different things that you do with your phone as well. So there's six modalities of data that is all embedded into the same space. Now we're not using you know, this particular model. It's called, again, it's called image bind. It's not using any, it's not describing images and turning images into text. It's not turning audio into text via, you know, uh, via some sort of transcription service or anything like that. It's actually taking the raw data, the raw bytes and turning those into an embedding. And you get really, really powerful results from it, right? So you can do, so I'm gonna focus on this first box here. This is from the image mind paper. Um, if you give it audio of, let's say the crackle of a fire and you want to retrieve images and videos that are relevant to it, you get well, images and videos of fires. Same thing with a baby cooing, right? You get 
videos of that. Uh, you get images of that. You get visual data of that as well. You can do the same thing for depth images as well as for text as well. So uh, if I have the exact same audio on the left and I want to retrieve the most relevant text based on that audio, now all of a sudden I have you know, these sentences that are really, really similar to that audio as well. So cross modal retrieval across many, many different modalities that is one of that is what where embedding models are going as well, and that is what's going to form the basis of RAG 2.0. Again, this is called ImageBind. I'm actually, going to use ImageBind in the upcoming example here, but um, but uh, you know it's it's one of the really really key the core ways that we're going to be doing uh, multimodal RAG, not just right now but in the near future as well. So again, not turning these pieces of unstructured data into text. But what we're going to be doing instead is embedding those raw bits and bytes directly as vectors. So I have about five minutes left. Uh, ideally, I would leave a little bit of time at the very end for some Q&A as well. But what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to talk about uh, I'm going to talk about the retrieval portion only. So again, if I go back to this RAG 2.0 architecture, you have this retrieval that goes on in your vector database, and then after that retrieval happens, you you, know, you insert it as context in your generative AI model. You do some prompt engineering, some tuning. Maybe you go back to the vector database, retrieve some more data, uh, and then you get a reliable answer that way. I'm going to skip this portion here. Again, because a lot of models today, the full capabilities of GPT-40 haven't been released, um, because that's not there yet. It's hard to tune a fun, an end-to-end -end system and show you what that might look like without those capabilities. But what I will show you today is the R portion, the retrieval portion, how we do multimodal retrieval and how we get images and audio that are most relevant to the data that we're looking at. So without further ado, I'm gonna switch tabs here. So I'm gonna share this tab instead. So this is, I've, I've sort of run, run this already. Uh, once before, but what I'm what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to clear the output of all cells here, make that a little bit bigger, and what I'm showing right here is again just that retrieval portion. So I've downloaded the uh, the the Google I/O pre-show. I've actually downloaded download I think the first minute or two minutes of it, and what we're going to do is that pre-show has visual data and it has audio data as well. I'm going to use a library called Radiant. Uh, this is actually a library that I created myself specifically to help turn um, unstructured data into vector embeddings. It works with a variety of different modalities. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Radiant and store, you know, turn this video into vectors. I'm going to store those vectors inside of Milvis. Milvis is a uh, you know is a cloud native vector database, um, and then what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to sort of retrieve the most relevant bits and pieces of information there. You can I've already installed Radiant locally, uh, but if you haven't, you can just pip install it, um, and it will actually install all the dependencies that you need for you. So Milvis now has a Milvis Lite version. It will install that dependency automatically if it detects that you need it. If you already have it, it's not going to do it. So let's just get started right away, right? Um, I'm gonna do these imports first. And the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna do some insertion. So again, I wanna run you through what's going on here. Basically, I have a path to a video. And this video, again, is the pre-show to Google I.O. It's the first minute of it. I haven't downloaded the full thing. Otherwise, it would take probably a little bit way too long to actually get that up and running. And with Radiant, not only can you just vectorize stuff just out of the box, but you can also create these workflows. And uh, what I've done here is I've created a workflow to actually read this file, right? So the first minute of the Google I.O. pre-show from 2024, I'm going to send it into a transformation called Video Demux. And what that's gonna do, it's gonna separate the audio and the images into one second audio snippets and one frame every one second. And then I'm going to vectorize all the audio and all the video with the image bind model, right? After I have those vectors, I'm going to store them in Milvis using the insert operation. And again, you know, if you're familiar with Milvis, um, you know, you'll see this is not the typical way that you interact with it, but I've packaged it all into a single runner to make it very, very easy for you to do. 
So let's just get running that right away. It's going to take a while. So I'm actually going to sort of introduce a search workflow to you as well. Uh, you know, it has a uh, it has all these uh, sort of areas that's popping up, but that's that's okay. And from here, actually, what you'll see is um, there's you know we have a search workflow as well. And this workflow, we can actually what we're going to do what we're going to do is we're going to turn we're going to vectorize text, right? So that's this modality right here. And then once that is done, we're going to send the result of that into Milwis, but instead of inserting it, we're just going to search the fields and then we're going to, we're going to get output fields as well. And what that's going to do for us is it's going to allow us to, you know, very, very easily in a very simple workflow, I've taken a video, turned it into vectors, insert them into a vector database. And then from that point forward, I now have another workflow that I'm using to actually search that vector database, given some text as well. I'm doing all of this with embeddings, all of this uh, with multimodal retrieval and all of it with the image bind library as well. Again, this insert workflow is still running. Once that's done, I'll run the search workflow. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to go back to this tab, to the presentation here. Uh, and I do want to say, if you want to reach out to me uh, while, that, uh, while that notebook is running, if you want to reach out to me, if you have any questions um, or if you want to uh, you know, interact with me on, on Twitter or on LinkedIn, uh, these are the links to use. Uh, I know I should have put a QR code here. Um, I did not get around to that. And uh, I apologize to all the folks where this is a little bit cumbersome. Uh, but feel free to get in touch with me. I'll leave this up for, for a little bit if, uh, if any of you want to, uh, uh, want, to, want to go to those URLs uh, while we wait for the, uh, the notebook to finish running. I know I'm getting a little bit short on time here. So We also um, have one question from the audience, by the way. Okay, sure. Let's go for that question then. What encompasses an embedding model? Yeah, that's a great question. An embedding model is just anything that takes data that you have and turns them into vectors, turns them into, let's say, uh, you know, turn them into something that represents that input data. And I, I know this is probably a little bit, you know, for folks who are unfamiliar with RAG or unfamiliar with what embeddings are, it's probably a little bit of a bit of a deep dive. But essentially, you can just think of it this way, right? If I have unstructured data that is similar to each other, if I have images or text that is similar to, to each other, that is relevant to each other, the embeddings are going to be closer to each other as well when I generate those embeddings. Um, this is still taking a while to run. I'm going to share this tab instead. This is still taking a while to run. Uh, but I think what I will do instead is uh, if you reach out to me, oh, OK, so it's, it's done right there. Um, I'm going to run these really, really quickly. Uh, so you can see what the output of it is like. Uh, and again, I know I'm a little bit over time, so I apologize to uh, the wonderful host here, um, Eugene and Megan. But um, these I will, uh, once these should run pretty quickly. And again, it's just loading the model. It's going to vectorize this text here. What was unusual about the coffee mug? I'm actually going to show the results. And again, there's duplicate results here because I have run this twice. I've run the workflow twice. And then we can actually just show uh, one of the images in the results. And you can actually see this is a frame from the Google I.O. pre-show. And you can see the coffee mug right here. It's a little bit, you know, you can, it's a little bit strange for sure. Um, and that is that you leave up to the large language model to answer after you do the retrieval step. Cool. So I'm going to stop sharing. And again, I want to say thank you to our wonderful hosts here um, for, uh, you know, for, for, for having me on this show. Yeah, thanks for coming on, Frank. <clears throat> I think uh, it would be really helpful if you could link us that uh, notebook uh, into Absolutely. the chat. Yeah, uh, for the yeah. audience, really appreciate that.